The Werewolf of London is a classic horror film from 1935 that tells the story of a botanist who turns into a werewolf after being bitten by a strange creature. This movie was one of the first to feature a werewolf and has some surprising moments that will make you laugh, jump, and maybe even feel a bit sad. Now, I'm curious, do you remember the first time you watched Werewolf of London? What was it like? And did you know there are some fascinating stories behind the making of this film that aren't widely known? We're eager to hear about your experiences with Werewolf of London. Share your most memorable moments or any personal stories related to this film in the comments. Your stories add to the rich history of this movie and we can't wait to read them. The 1935 film Werewolf of London, recognized as the first werewolf movie with sound, stands as a noteworthy entry in the genre. Despite its age and the slower pace that characterizes many scenes filled with dialogue, the film delivers a potent dose of horror true to the Universal Studios tradition. The casting of Henry Hull as the werewolf is a point of contention. His performance is more restrained and less emotive compared to other actors of the era, which diminishes the viewer's empathy typically reserved for the werewolf character. Warner Olin's portrayal of Dr. Yogami, the original werewolf, brings a subtle and unsettling presence to the film. The romantic subplot featuring Valerie Hobson and Lester Matthews is less compelling, often feeling out of place amidst the film's darker themes. The production values, however, with a convincing depiction of London and an effective musical score contribute to the film's atmosphere. Hull's character is portrayed as a conflicted individual, retaining his intellect even as he transforms, driven by the necessity to kill to prevent a permanent change rather than by pure savagery. His transformation scenes, including his ventures into the night clad in the coat and hat, add a unique touch to the character. The minimalistic approach to his makeup is also notable, creating a distinctive and memorable villain. While Werewolf of London may not be heralded as a masterpiece, it holds its own as a solid film that deserves recognition alongside other prominent horror films of the 1930s. In the mid-20th century, a classic horror film was reintroduced to audiences through television and later on DVD. It was initially part of a larger collection that brought 52 notable titles to TV screens, expanding the following year with additional features. The film's promotion on DVD highlighted a trailer that had been modified from its original version. Notably, it only mentioned two actors by name, omitting Warner Oland, whose scenes were still included despite his passing years before the re-release. This editing choice was likely made to give the film a more contemporary feel. Additionally, one of the film's actresses, Valerie Hobson, earned a modest salary for her role in another horror classic released the same year, reflecting her status as a young, emerging actress at the time. In the early days of horror cinema, Henry Hull took on a role that connected him to his personal history, as his wife was the descendant of a notable Civil War figure. His prominence in the film is marked by his name leading the credits, yet Warner Olin's name is presented with larger letters, hinting at his greater fame at the time. Olin, known for his portrayal of Charlie Chan, had a unique look that required minimal makeup, thanks to his ancestry, which resonated with audiences, especially those from China who saw a reflection of themselves in him. In the classic film, the on-screen couple had a significant age difference, with the actor portraying the husband being 27 years older than his counterpart. The production of the film spanned over a month, beginning mid-January and wrapping up towards the end of February, with audiences first seeing it in theaters in early June. Additionally, one of the actresses shared a close personal relationship with another prominent actress of that era, known for her numerous film appearances. In the landscape of Hollywood's golden era, Spring Byington's career is chronicled in Axel Nissen's work, highlighting her roles from the 30s to the 50s. In the early stages of a certain film, Reginald Barlow was slated to portray Dr. Phillips, a character who consults with Dr. Glendon. However, this subplot was omitted from the final cut, aligning with Glendon's lone wolf persona. Instead, Barlow appeared as the uncredited caretaker, Timothy. Meanwhile, Bella Lugosi, initially considered for the role of Dr. Yagami, was engaged in the production of Mark of the Vampire, leading to his replacement in the film. In the mid-20th century, Spring Byington took to the skies, starting flying lessons in California. However, her aspirations were grounded by the studio due to insurance concerns. Around the same time, Warner Olin's acting prowess was already evident in the early 19th as he graced the stage in Shakespearean productions and Ibsen plays, gaining recognition for his talent. 
Meanwhile, Valerie Hobson, after her film roles, joined the Screen Actors Guild, marking her commitment to her acting career. In the early days of werewolf cinema, filmmakers experimented with the lore surrounding these mythical creatures. The idea that a werewolf's transformation was tied to the full moon was not a staple in the initial films. This concept was notably absent in the 1941 film The Wolfman, only to be reintroduced in later movies. Henry Hall, who played the lead role in the earlier werewolf film, had a significant say in the makeup design for his character. Despite common misconceptions, Hall did not oppose the makeup, but rather advocated for a less hairy appearance to ensure his character remained recognizable. This decision was later verified by Hull in an interview and supported by his grandnephew, Cortland Hull. Additionally, Spring Byington, known for her television popularity, was an avid fan of science fiction and even promoted a science fiction magazine during her career peak. Her enthusiasm for the genre was evident beyond her screen roles, showcasing her personal interests aligning with her professional work. In the twilight of his career, Warner Oland, known for his detective roles, faced a personal crisis. His health deteriorated rapidly after his final film, leading to a public incident that revealed his condition. He spent his last days in his native Sweden, where he passed away from pneumonia. Ethel Griffiths, an actress with a long-standing career, notably portrayed the character Grace Poole twice, once in the mid-1930s and again nearly a decade later. Henry Hall, originating from Louisville, Kentucky, had a connection to the theater world through his father, who worked with a prominent theater syndicate in New York City. This background paved the way for Hull's entry into acting and his eventual role in a film that explored the darker aspects of human nature. In a notable early horror film, a scene was scripted where a young boy narrowly escapes being devoured by a carnivorous plant thanks to the timely intervention of a character named Wilfred. However, this particular moment never made it to the screen. The lead actor, Henry Hull, is recognized for his portrayal of the central lycanthropic character, marking a significant moment in cinematic history as the first feature-length film to explore the werewolf theme. This was a pioneering step, following Universal's earlier short film that depicted a woman seeking vengeance in the form of a wolf. Additionally, the film featured Spring Byington, whose lineage traces back to parents Edwin Lee and Helene Maud Byington, prominent figures in their own right. In the early days of horror cinema, actor Henry Hole took on a role that paid him a weekly salary of 2750 slightly higher than his contemporary Boris Karloff. This compensation included additional payments for specialized scenes and agent fees. Meanwhile, Warner Olin, another actor in the same era, not only contributed to the silver screen, but also to literature, translating significant works of August Strindberg with his wife, Edith. Their efforts brought these plays to an English-speaking audience in 1912. Olin's final resting place is in Southborough, Massachusetts, where his unique gravestone, crafted from a step of his cherished home, marks his contribution to both film and literature.